Definitive Treatment of Pelvic Ring Injuries. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Gerard Allen and I'm Saqib Rahman narrating. In the first video, we talked about the concept of stability, uh, tile classification, and uh, we're going to shift gears now and uh, talk a little bit more about posterior ring uh, reduction, fixation techniques. Um, so sacroiliac joint reduction is usually done indirectly when you reduce the anterior ring, but it can be performed open uh, if you use the lateral window of the ilioinguinal approach. Um, and go all the way posteriorly, uh, you can get to the SI joint. Uh, or you could go um, posteriorly, uh, through a, if you're prone, through a paramedian approach. Um, so uh, these, these images show a couple of views of uh, how you can uh, reduce the SI joint directly. If you look at the top right, you can see uh, there is a clamp used with a tine Posterior on the ilium, uh, right here, and uh, another one on the anterior sacral ala here. You do have to be cautious anytime you're open and reducing the SI joint because remember the L L5 nerve root is going to run anterior on the sacral ala. Um, and if you think about here, it's going to be right about here. So when you're working at the SI joint, you really you know, you, you have to kind of stay uh, in in this area here. You really can't get too far over this way. Uh, or you'll run into L5 nerve root. Uh, you can see here using the Youngbluth clamp uh, on the bottom two images with two screws to help uh, guide in your reduction um, posteriorly through the open approach. So this is how you can do an open reduction. Um, I also mentioned already that you know this is uh, also more frequently done indirectly um, by getting the anterior um, pelvis reduced or with an external fixator C clamp we showed in a different video on acute management uh, distractor can be used like an external fixator um, or you can do we said uh, an open reduction through a posterior paramedian approach um, shown here this is done in the prone position. So, uh, as shown here, you have um, uh, basically shans pins um, attached to T-handle chucks. Uh, you may also need to have traction in place. And there is, these are used to uh, manipulate the, uh, the hemipelvis and uh, get a uh, reduction that way. And then you can fix with uh, iliosacral screws or if you're... Um, um, Using other techniques, you could potentially, you know, do that here as well. Uh, we're going to show some other methods, um, such as transiliac plating. That's another technique that you use a similar approach for. Uh, crescent fracture reduction is something you see with the LC2 pattern, right? This is that fracture dislocation of the SI joint with that posterior iliac fracture. So indirectly, you reduce these with traction, internal external fixators, distractor, or by getting the anterior um, ring reduced. But uh, a lot of times it's it's a fracture dislocation of the joint. And if you wanna get direct reduction, you may need to do a formal open reduction. Um, if you go anterior, you can go through the lateral window of the ilioinguinal approach, or you can go posteriorly as shown in the previous, in the previous uh, slides and uh, do direct lag screw fixation or compression plating. So treatment options of the posterior ring are percutaneous. These are for fixation, percutaneous sacroiliac screws, percutaneous transiliac transsacral screws, percutaneous lumbopelvic fixation, or you know, just open lumbopelvic fixation, open sacroiliac joint plating. Um, we showed a technique where you can place screws and a young booth clamp across the uh, ant anterior aspect of the SI joint for reduction. Well, you can just imagine if you can expose for that, you can also expose to put a plate there, um, and uh, lumbopelvic fusion. So uh, percutaneous fixation is done very frequently. It's minimally invasive. We showed in the video on acute management of pelvic ring injuries that occasionally this is done as a resuscitative aid. That is when you have gross widening on presentation, uh, you can't get the posterior ring closed down well. Sometimes if you 
are very capable and you have the right person on call and the right team, you can uh, do these very efficiently, percutaneously, and close things down as a resuscitative aid. So um, here you can see uh, the sacroiliac screws sort of shown in these ghost CT scan recon images um, uh, shown through the uh, into the S1 um, body here. These are sacroiliac screws crossing the joint. And then you have the transiliac transsacral screw shown through S2 here, okay? And um, that is where you basically pass a screw all the way across all six cortices perpendicular to the long axis of the sacrum. So when you're getting iliosacral, uh, when, you, when you're doing iliosacral screws, you need to get an inlet view, an outlet view, and most people will also get a sacral lateral view. And here's where you wanna look for this iliac cortical density, uh, for which you typically are gonna stay, it's right about here, which is, you're gonna typically wanna stay posterior to that to avoid anterior breaching, which can damage the L5 nerve root. So that's kind of where you would place your SI screws or trans, um, iliac transsacral screws, and uh, that's where you would see each of those screws on each of these views. So you can see the iliosacral screws going through S1 and the transiliac transsacral screw going through S2. So we mentioned already that the L5 nerve root is at risk anteriorly, so the lateral sacral view helps to assist in determining if the L5 nerve root's in, da in uh, danger of becoming damaged. So the iliac cortical density you know, you want to get a good view to show overlap of those two densities. And this kind of gives you a sense of the slope of the sacral ala. And if you can stay posterior to that, usually safe. If you put a wire or drill bit anterior to that iliac cortical density, um, then that can place the nerve root in danger. Meaning like if you, if you place that screw somewhere like over here, you want to stay away from there. So... Uh, the blue area um, represents safe zones for screw placement. And uh, if you're going to put more than one screw, uh, you should be anterior and caudal, and the other one is posterior and cranial. So there you can see if you're – sometimes you will put two screws, for instance, in, uh, in S1, for example, which can often accommodate it. Now, where you can't accommodate it, and sometimes you can't even accommodate one screw – is sacral dysmorphism. So in sacral dysmorphism, you have um, essentially a lumbarized S1, and sometimes you can have a sacralized L5, but basically you just don't have um, very, very clear-cut L5 to S1 transition uh, in like five lumbar bodies and five sacral bodies. So that's when you have dysmorphism. So what happens is, and sometimes this can be unilateral, it can be bilateral, the iliac cortical density is just, you, you can't really use it effectively. Um, so features are, you may have this acute upper sacral segment slope. So instead of coming flat across, it causes this acute angle. You may notice that the height of the sacrum, uh, I'm sorry, you may um, yeah, notice the height of the sacrum is uh, similar to that of the iliac wing. You may, be, you may see mammillary processes, an irregular uh, round-shaped S1 nerve tunnel, so just may not look normal. Uh, you may see on your inlet view a dorsally recessed upper sacral segment. On the outlet view, you may see a residual S1 disc. And a lot of these findings you can see on CT scan. You really don't want to wait until you're in the operating room putting screws in to find out that you have dysmorphism. This is something you need to identify preoperatively. So um, if you want to uh, look more, head over to otaonline.org, uh, and you can see some preoperative planning for percutaneous screws here. So I mentioned before that uh, sometimes you may have to consider plate fixation. So as you can see here, the SI joint is probably right about here. So you really only get like one screw. So a lot of times you'll have to do two plates because you can't really put a long plate across the back of the sacrum because of the L5 nerve root, which runs right about here. So sometimes if you're going to plate these, you have to put a couple of them. Uh, and this is a case where you may have 
sacro iliac joint that can't be reduced closed uh you just don't have safe uh bony tunnels to put percutaneous screws um and we talked about how you can approach this uh, previously through the lateral window of the ilioinguinal approach i also briefly mentioned that um if you can't do iliosacral screws for whatever reason, you don't have good visualization, you have um, dysmorphism, for example, um, you can do transiliac tension band plating. So in this case, you do bilateral paramedian approaches, then you can take a long, long recon plate, bend it, you sort of tunnel it uh, deep to the tissues across and then you plate onto the posterior ilium bilaterally, or you, I should say you uh, fix to the posterior ilium bilaterally uh, with uh, cortical screws. So you're not really doing iliosacral screws here. You're just sort of tension band plating the back of the pelvis to sort of make up for the um, injured um, um, posterior uh, ligaments or um, if you have a vertical sacral fracture, it's going to neutralize against uh, displacement. Lumbopelvic dis, uh, instrumentation is something that's done if you have, for example, um, a um, atypical fracture of the sacrum in which you have essentially lumbopelvic or spinal pelvic uh, dissociation. And what that means is that you may have a sacral fracture, like a U-shaped or H-shaped sacral fracture in which um, there can be kyphosis or translation and um, the spine is essentially no longer connected to the uh, to the pelvis, right? So there can be a, a collapse at the level of the upper sacrum and this puts the nerve roots at, in danger at the S1, S2 level and potentially all of the sacral nerve roots. So a way to bypass that um, uh, fracture and uh, and provide stability is to fix from L5 into the iliac wings and you bypass that upper sacral segment that's uh, collapsed and um, that can be done through lumbopelvic fixation as shown here and they've also shown uh, iliosacral transilio uh, transsacral screws here um, and um, these can be done the, the 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 bolts posteriorly can be fairly prominent and many times these may need to be removed. Uh, overall, biomechanical data uh, lacks in comparison study. Uh, it is helpful to have more than one point of fixation, like more than just a single iliosacral screws. There is a, a reasonable rate of failure, um, sometimes in very unstable fractures, if you just have like one screw. Um, Lumbo pelvic fixation really adds stability. So you can do so-called triangular fixation in some unstable fractures where you do iliosacral screw fixation plus lumbopelvic fixation. Uh, again, it requires um, you know separate approach in the prone position, and the implants can sometimes be a little bit prominent. All right, so let's pause here, and then we'll finish up in the third and final video talking about anterior pelvis reduction and fixation techniques.